And I think we both know what that are like. In 1961, Stanley Kubrick adapted the controversial novel Lolita by author Vladimir Nabokov. Quilty? Quilty? Well, well. What's that? Are you Quilty? No, I'm Spartacus. You come to free the slaves or something? Are you Quilty? Yeah, yeah, I'm Quilty, yeah, sure. Uh... Lolita, which Kubrick had been working on while he was going through his great Spartacus endeavors and um, was busy trying to sort of put it together, um, was clearly gonna be um, a difficult project. The book was notorious. Even then, you couldn't think of anything more controversial. I mean, it was, like, a, I mean, a ridiculously controversial film for him to make. And not surprisingly, although he got marvelous actors in it from James Mason, Shelley Winters, Peter Sellers, not surprisingly, it did fall foul of all kinds of organizations and people that objected to the actual content of the movie. It runs the gamut of the book pretty well. It's beautifully produced and it's beautifully shot. It has a very, very eccentric uh, performance by Peter Sellers, which actually somehow alleviates and stops it being as distasteful as it might have been. I am Dr. Zempf. Dr. Humbert, I'm pleased to meet you. I am the Beardsley High School a psychologist. Uh, have you been here? I mean, uh, um, how did you get in? Well, uh, your little daughter opens the door to me on the way to her piano lesson, and she said I was to wait in here until your arrival. Uh -huh. And so, here I am. Kubrick had been deeply impressed by Peter Seller's work on Lolita and decided to cast him in multiple roles in his next project, the black comedy Dr. Strangelove, or How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love the Bomb. Our doomsday scheme cost us just a small fraction of what we've been spending on defense in a single year. But the deciding factor was when we learned that your country was working along similar lines and we were afraid of a doomsday gap. This is preposterous. I've never approved of anything like that. Our source was the New York Times. Dr. Strangelove, do we have anything like that in the works? A moment, please, Mr. President. Under the authority granted me as director of weapons research and development, I commissioned last year a study of this project by the Bland Corporation. Based on the findings of the report, my conclusion was that this idea was not a practical deterrent for reasons which at this moment must be all too obvious. For Kubrick's next film, Dr. Strangelove, he had absolute control. He produced, he directed, and he wrote. So everything on screen was him, essentially. And it was a hugely successful, great movie. It was his first truly great movie, in my opinion. It's a Cold War satire. It's about uh, an American, effectively an American commander who goes mad and decides to attack the Soviet Union. Uh, and the, the British and the American you know, political class trying to prevent the end of the world. I know I'll have to answer what I've done. I think I can. Yes, well, of course you can, Jack. Of course you can. You can. I'm a religious man myself, you know, Jack. I believe in all that sort of thing, and uh, I'm hoping, you know, Jack. You dropped your gun, Jack. Yes. You know what I'm here? No, Jack, let me take that for you. I'll take that for you, Jack. And uh, you know what I'm hoping, Jack? I'm hoping you're going to give me the code, boy. That's what I'm hoping. And, uh, well, you're going to have a little wash and brush up, are you? What a good idea. Always did wonders for a man, that, Jack. A little wash and brush up, water on the back of the neck, and makes you feel marvellous. That's what we need, Jack. Water on the back of the neck and the code. Now, now, supposing I play a little guessing game with you, Jack, boy. I'll try and guess, I'll try and guess what the code is. Kubrick turned his eye upon the big news of the era he lived in, the Cold War, uh, the potential for mankind to eradicate himself via nuclear war. But as he said, 
The more he investigated this subject, the more he probed it, the more absurd it started to seem. Every route he took with it became funny and mad, you know, insane. And he said the only way he could ever grasp or begin to grasp this subject was through comedy. There was no other way you could reflect upon nuclear war than by laughing at it. If, on the other hand, we were to immediately launch an all-out and coordinated attack on all their airfields and missile bases, we'd stand a damn good chance of catching them with their pants down. Out of that, he created, you know, uh, one of the great anti-war masterpieces in, in Dr. Strangelove. Um, an extraordinary funny picture about the bleakest possible subject. Um, it hinges upon a wonderful threefold uh, central performance from Peter Sellers. They got on so well on the Lolita. Kubrick loved that ability he had to just become what Kubrick wanted him to become. You know, he was the ultimate sponge, you know. He said to sort of turn him in the right direction and he would create these characters on the spot. Kubrick loved that, you know, that kind of excitement. He plays the, the British officer trying to stop this, but, and he plays the American president, and he also plays the standout character, Dr. Strangelove himself, who's effectively a Nazi war criminal helping the Americans with their nuclear program. The film has huge scope and range. Even though a lot of it is set indoors, it still feels like it's got mighty vistas. And in particular, there's a final sequence where the only pilot to get through to the Soviet Union jumps out of the plane riding his bomb down with it like a cowboy sort of whooping in like a rodeo and it's an astonishing piece of work it, when you see that you're you're you know that's an absolute signature ending for Kubrick <laughs> hey what about major Kong <laughs> Following the huge success of Dr. Strangelove, it would be four years before Kubrick released his next film, the immensely ambitious 2001 A Space Odyssey. After envisioning, you know, the apocalypse and nuclear war, Kubrick's mind quite naturally, uh, I think, ventured to the space race. Um, that actually, in many respects, the Cold War and you know, the nuclear arms build-up had a sort of parallel journey in the comp competition between America and Russia to, to get into space. We're now in America. My generation was brought up on the space race, the whole space thing. It, it was all about outer space and beating Russia. And uh, Kubrick was very, very interested in space as well. He was interested in the work of Arthur C. Clarke. He was interested in what it all meant. Spends two years about designing the sets, crack special effects team. And every time you know that when a Kubrick movie is going to come out, you get, a, you get another level in terms of technology. It, that, that's just how he works. You know, the cameras are going to get another thing with the cameras. Everything is going to be different. The number of um, innovations, technical innovations, filming innovations that um, were required or developed in the process of this film are absolutely unbelievably numerous. Many of them actually are due to the input of Douglas Trumbull, who created much of the special effects in conjunction with Kubrick. They obviously fired off each other. They just they, they realized that this was their opportunity to take filmmaking into another dimension, almost literally. It ends in a spectacular sequence that was using a technique invented specifically for the film called slit scan, which was a, a very, very trippy collection of visuals and lights and patterns. Uh, and when the movie was first released, it was released on curved cinema screens. So you'd be right up at the front when the movie would be all around you.
after 2001, Kubrick's next project would be the most controversial film of his entire career, A Clockwork Orange. The Durango 95 purred away real horror show. A nice, warm, vibratory feeling all through your gutty woods. Soon it was trees and dark, my brothers, with real country dark. To go from 2001 A Space Odyssey to Anthony Burgess's A Clockwork Orange seems like a mighty leap. And yet, A Clockwork Orange is, in a way, another science fiction film. It just is a more concrete, down-to-earth one. This is a horror movie by any other name. It's a film about what, if it isn't happening now or wasn't happening then, it is a projection of what is going to happen in the very near future if we proceed with the way society is going. This is, of course, um, Anthony Burgess's prediction. Um, it was picked up and run with by Kubrick, who saw all kinds of possibilities in the story of Alex and his droogs. A Clockwork Orange is probably the most controversial film he ever made, set in England, where this band of droogs set about uh, destroying everything that most people held dear. Kubrick was nominated as Best Director in both the Academy Awards and Golden Globes, and then didn't win either. It did very well in America when it opened commercially. It, um, it was a reasonably, it was well received critically and it did very quite well here actually. It only took a couple of incidents that seemed to be related to A Clockwork Orange for the Fiorari to sort of blow up. And Kubrick decided that he wanted the film withdrawn. In 1973, he persuaded Warners that it needed to be withdrawn from distribution in the UK. It was thought to be, by some critics, uh, an exploitative movie. And this upset uh, Kubrick immensely. Now, many people never saw the film at all before expressing an opinion about it. My own opinion is that it wasn't really exploitative. It did go quite a long way along that line. But I think it was about something important, about um, the violence inherent in every human being and the way we should counteract it. Where I was taken to, brothers, was like no cine I ever vidded before. I was bound up in a straitjacket, and McGulliver was strapped to a headrest with like wires running away from it. Then they clamped like lid locks on the eyes so that I could not shut them, no matter how hard I tried. It seemed a bit crazy to me, but I let them get on with what they wanted to get on with. If I was to be a free young Malchik again in a fortnight's time, I would put up with much in the meantime, oh my brothers. In 1975, Kubrick returned to his habit of pushing the technical boundaries of filmmaking, but this time with a period piece in Barry Lyndon. Feel the blue? Barry Lyndon is a sharp change of pace for Kubrick. Uh, having gone from these epic sci-fi visions of, of technology and of violence, Barry Lyndon is a, it's a Thackeray novel and it's about a social climbing Irishman in British society. Um, it starred Ryan O'Neill as Barry Lyndon, and the, the, the technical achievements nonetheless were still there. Kubrick is still pushing back what's possible with cameras. He's still inventing, he's still creating, partly because he refused to let any electric light be used in the shoot. Everything had to be done by candlelight and natural light. He has a camera that NASA had developed in which he's able to do that and make them look like paintings. Gainsborough's Hogarth, he becomes an expert on the 18th century. He, he shoots at Blenheim Palace, he goes into, into Germany. He wants to get everything authentically right. He has the great Michael Hoare and the great stage actors, the sort of unreliable narrator, which is very much the 18th century. And uh, it is an unbelievable motion picture. 